Okay, uh, let's get started. So uh, welcome everybody to uh, today's EPIC conference panel, uh, which is on Get Published. Um, my name's Andrew uh, Sixsmith. Um, I'm professor of gerontology at Simon Fraser University. A lot of you may know me. I am also associate director of AgeWell and was the founding co-director of AgeWell. Um, I presume everybody does know AgeWell, but just in case you're um, you're um, on the uh, on the webinar now and you don't know who AgeWell is, I would recommend that you have a look at the AgeWell website. So AgeWell is Canada's technology and aging network, which connects together a community of researchers, industry partners, government. Um, older adults and caregivers uh, together to look at how we can use technology um, to support the health and well-being and independence and social participation of older people. So the topic today um, for this EPIC, so again for those of you who don't know what EPIC stands for, it's Early Professionals Inspired Careers and this is AgeWell's training program. Um, we have a conference uh, focus on our uh, trainees, our highly qualified persons, or HQP, and the and the session today is going to be on getting published, which is a really key issue for um, for students, for trainees, for early care career researchers. So the idea of the session today is really to give you some ideas and insights into how you can get published through AgeWell and also. Um, to get the, the the personal views of uh, various people who've been involved as HQP at various stages in the career um, it, as, as HQP within AgeWell. So having um, having people's perspectives on on getting published, the opportunities and the challenges of it, uh, I think will be really valuable for for students. Um, before we go on, um, my final fellow panelists and I would like to respectfully acknowledge that we are located on the unceded homeland of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations and Mississaugas uh, of the credit, uh, the Anishwabek and the Chippewa and the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat and the neutral peoples whose histories, languages and cultures influence our vibrant community. A few housekeeping items. Today's panel is comprised of four presentations for the first 40 minutes, and there'll be time for questions and answers following each presentation, uh, where the panelists will answer questions from the audience, and there'll be time for additional Q&As uh, at the end, when panelists will answer questions from the audience. You may post these questions in the Q&A box in the chat. The questions will be recorded and the link will be available uh, sorry, the session, be, be aware of this, the session will be recorded and the link will be available on the AgeWell website. Um, so very briefly, I'm going to introduce who will be on the panel tonight. Uh, so I'm uh, Andrew Sixsmith, as I said before, I'm going to be um, just giving uh, some ideas about how to get published through, uh, through AgeWell. Uh, we have Meilan Fang. Um, from uh, Dundee University in the United Kingdom and of the Star Institute at Simon Fraser University. Uh, we have no La Lana uh, Neubauer, uh, University of Edmonton, but also a practi practicing occupational therapist. And we have Charlene Chu, who is an assistant professor at, uh, at University of Toronto School of Nursing. So we've got some very uh, diverse perspectives and, uh, and uh, people at different stages of the career, like I'm coming towards the end of my career. Uh, the other panelists are gonna certainly give you better ideas about what the experience is of being an early career researcher and a, and a, and a highly qualified person uh, when it comes to publications. Okay, so uh, 
what I'd like to do, uh, do is just get started by talking about some of the publications that AgeWell is trying to uh, push along at the moment and what opportunities um, uh, you might have as HQP in uh, getting published through, uh, through AgeWell's uh, initiatives. Could I have the next slide, please? All right, I've just introduced you guys. So, <laughs> so we'll go on from there. Next slide, please. So yeah, I'm Andrew Sixsmith. We're gonna be talking about publication opportunities at AgeWell. So uh, just a few things here is that um, AgeWell um, is providing some limited funding for various uh, publications opportunities, which we think are strategically valuable for the network. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, one thing I'd really like to highlight here is that uh, AgeWell as a network really wants to support the participation of highly qualified persons of HQP in all our activities. So we really uh, put uh, HQP at the forefront. So anything that we do, we really would like to have HQP very much involved as authors, as presenters, as organizers of workshops and things like that. So as students don't feel um, backward about coming forward when it comes to thinking about things that you might like to do. And we'll talk about a few of those. Um, so there is some funding from AgeWell. Uh, it's not a lot, but I it's enough to make a few things happen, which uh, is better than nothing. Um, so let me first start by talking about uh, the Springer, previously Morgan and Claypool publishers, Synthesis, Synthesis Digital Library of Engineering and Computer Science. Um, so AgeWell has a relationship with Springer, the publishers, um, uh, on this uh, digital library of engineering computer science um, uh, monographs. Uh, it, we have a specific subseries on age tech. And I really like to encourage people to think about publishing their work um, as these short um, monographs, which will really give a, an overview of a particular area that you're working in. Um, so right now, uh, we're publishing in conjunction with Springer uh, an AgeWell subseries on the eight challenge areas. So if you don't know the challenge areas of AgeWell, these include things like cognitive health and dementia, autonomy and, and independence, um, healthcare and health service delivery, uh, staying connected, um, and there's four more, um, all of which were uh, supportive communities, supportive housing, employment, and financial well-being, mobility and transport. I think that's all eight of our challenge areas. And the aim is to have um, a, a monograph which uh, covers all the eight of our challenge areas. And really these monographs uh, represent a kind of an environmental scan of what's happening in terms of technology development and implementation and innovation within these eight challenge areas. So most of those have been, um, been uh, commissioned and we have six or seven in the pipeline already. We are expanding into other topics. For example, um, in the pipeline, we're looking at ethical issues in age tech. We're looking, um, and I'm having meetings with people next week on technology in end of life and palliative care. And then another book potentially on uh, the aesthetics of design and technology. So around art, technology and healthy aging. Uh, and then another one that I've ha had some uh, conversations with potential authors is about using virtual reality uh, to support cognitive, um, cognitive well-being and independence. Um, one, so if people are interested in publishing uh, within our series, I really like, uh, suggest that you have a look at uh, the series. Um, you may want to have a look at the Cognitive Health and Dementia book and the Autonomy and Independence book in, the, uh, in this series. Uh, and we can provide you in the chat a link to the series, I think, um, if you want to follow that up. And have a look at that. And um, if that's of interest to you, I'd be more than happy to speak to you. Um, 
one other uh, initiative we've had over recent years, and I actually encourage you to read it, is a book that we published um, through Springer called Knowledge, Innovation and Impact, a guide for the engaged health researcher. So again, I'm very happy to support people who are interested in getting uh, books published through Springer in this uh, broad field of age tech. Another potential area that you may be interested in, and maybe uh, we can, uh, AgeWell might be able to fund and support things around journal spe special issues. So for example, uh, we have a special issue of uh, the Canadian Health Service Management, uh, Health Management Forum um, uh, journal coming out, uh, which is um, a collection of, uh, of, um, of articles uh, by AgeWell authors, uh, including many uh, HQP on these uh, in uh, policy issues around health service provision. Um, we have another special issue of the Rate Journal, which I'm going to come on to in a minute, on robotics and um, robotics and care. Uh, if people are interested, and um, you hear a lot of um, journals who are requesting uh, authors to submit ideas for special journal, uh, special issues of journals, again, get in touch and we can have a discussion around that. So for example, uh, there's going to be a special issue uh, of the Journal of Mental Health and Aging, um, which is focusing on age tech for mental health in the, um, uh, in the coming, uh, coming months. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd just like to finish by mentioning the Rate Journal and um, Meilan Fang, who's the next speaker, is going to talk about this in more detail. But AgeWell uh, has a special relationship with the Journal of Rehabilitation and Assistive Technology Engineering, i.e. the Rate Journal. Um, and we have a number of, there's numbers of ways that, uh, that this special partnership that we have works. First of all, uh, we would really encourage everybody working within AgeWell to publish in the Rate Journal. Uh, so the um, uh, uh, I'm an associate uh, editor on on Rate, uh, along with Meilan Fang as well as uh, who is an associate editor. So we really encourage you to publish through Rate on anything that you've got of uh, that that may be of interest in the age tech sector. Uh, we also are publishing special um, special um, uh, issues around different topics. So for example, uh, one that's coming up is around robots to support caregiving and promote independent living of older adults. Uh, now, a couple of other things which are not on this slide, which I did want to mention, is that um, AgeWell, uh, uh, has a conference every year, and it's likely that we're going to have a conference in October for the first time in two years due to the pandemic. And we're very keen on publishing a conference special issue uh, based on uh, uh, based on papers presented at AgeWell's conference. So keep that in mind. That's an opportunity for you to publish as well. Now, I had a conversation with the editor in chief the other day about the potential for HQP publishing papers from this EPIC conference. So we've had a lot of HQP present papers uh, this week. Um, I had a conversation with our editor-in-chief about this, uh, and she says uh, it, it would be a great idea to think about a special issue around uh, with, that includes short papers uh, from uh, from the EPIC conference. Now that's still in the pipeline, it's not going to happen this year, but it may be something that we could do next year if there's a lot of interest. So if you want to get back to me, um, if you're interested in this sort of thing, I'd really uh, like to hear about that or put your comments in the chat, that would be great. Okay, I am now going to hand over, uh, before I do hand over, do we have any uh, questions? Um, so far. I think there's a lot of um, a lot of links have been put in the um, in the chat there. So if you want to follow those up, 
Uh, that will be great. Okay, uh, I will hand now over to uh, Maylan Fang, who's going to give you um, more background on her experiences in uh, getting published, and then with a specific, um, uh, some specific ideas around the uh, rate journal. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, next, next slide, please. So hi, everyone, just a bit of background about myself. So my name is May, and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Health Sciences at the University of Dundee. I'm also the open research champion in the school, which makes this publishing quite, um, this publishing agenda quite a good fit because one of the initiatives as part of our school is trying to find mechanisms and ways in which we can make our research more open and accessible, not only to academics, but to stakeholders of different backgrounds, uh, walks of life and expertise. I'm also an adjunct professor in the Department of Gerontology working with the Star Institute at Simon Fraser University. So we're really focusing on the age world challenge areas, looking at doing more community engaged research and focusing more on digital equity initiatives. I'm also one of the managing, I am the managing director of a WHO assistive technology for aging in place initiative, which is a collaboration between the International Society of Gerund Technology and WHO. So we're looking at ways in which we could um, find some criteria or measurements for good assistive technology and how we can make these more accessible and available um, across different aging populations. So today I'm going to be talking about the Journal of Rehabilitation and Assistive Technologies Engineering, of which I am one of the associate editors alongside another um, HWL member, HKP alumni, so our very own Vicky Komasar, she's based at UBC. So just noting that this journal, um, although it's focused on assistive technologies and engineering, it is becoming more broad. So it kind of aligns very well with my own interests, which is related to public health, so social and health inequities, thinking about digital inequities as part of that, environmental gerontology, so how can we develop environments that are more supportive for older people to live well and healthy and independent for as long as possible? It is also about thinking about ways in which we can work with older people when we're designing technology and thinking about the digital determinants of health. So as we're developing technology, what are the unintended consequences of technology for, for older people? We're pushing more and more for publications that are focusing around creative and co-creation methods as we're thinking about technology development. And of course, there's a huge kind of knowledge mobilization um, component, especially as it pertains to commercialization. So we don't want technology to be developed and sitting on a book, you know, sitting um, on a shelf somewhere unused and not creating any sort of impact. So um, next slide, please. So just quickly touching on my age well journey. So in the past, I was an HQP, so a highly qualified professional. Um, I later joined the CC3 team, which is focused on transdisciplinary working. So together with um, Dr. Pia Pontes and Judith Sixsmith, as well as Elisa Grigorovich, who is now at Brock University. Um, as an assistant professor. So I joined the team as an academic fellow looking at community engagement. So now after, you know, publishing with different colleagues at AgeWell and making these collaborations, I was able to now become a senior scholar in age tech at Star Institute and am currently an HQP alumni. So I did end up, you know, with, with all the opportunities um, achieve or, or get offered a, a faculty position at the University of Dundee. Next slide, please. So just a brief overview about this journal. So it is an open access peer review journal. It's been very interdisciplinary, looking at, as I've noted, engineering aspects, practical applications of rehabilitation and assistive technologies. It is indexed in both Web of Science and PubMed Central. Of course, it is a member of COPE, Committee on Public Ethics, 
as well as um, Clarivate analytics. So we are working towards um, gaining or developing an impact factor for this journal. It is a relatively new journal, but it's a great opportunity, again, as Andrew mentioned, to publish um, with us at rate. We have a strong connection with age well. Next slide, please. So the aims and scope. So to publish um, peer review work in age-related areas of rehabilitation, science, um, incontinence technology, blast injury rehabilitation, neural, reha neural rehabilitation, functional rehabilitation, um, and technologies in general, promoting independent living. So also anywhere where the application of engineering technology can be applied. So as noted, it's very interdisciplinary uh, with a focus on very practical applications of rehabilitation and assistive technologies. Next slide, please. So there's several opportunities with rate and I would recommend, um, you know, if you're looking to publish more, one of the key things to, to, to do is to serve as a reviewer, because that way you get a sense of the, the kind of process in which something gets published. And that was really helpful for me starting out because I got to kind of understand what are the criteria in which I need to, the different um, things I need to hit in order to get something published. So there are lots of opportunities to serve as a reviewer with race. Um, please feel free to email me directly if you are interested um, in serving as a reviewer when we're getting submissions. You can also engage as an author. So again, feel free to submit. As well, you can lead as a guest editor for special issue. As Andrew noted, uh, we recently have a special issue that's, that's currently underway. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is just um, an overview, a call for guest editors. So if you would like more information, please feel free to email me. Here is the link below um, if you're interested in, in having a look at what rate can offer. Next slide, please. So just a quick overview of the special collection. So it is a collection focusing on robots to support caregiving and promote independent living of older adults. So we have our very own Dr. Goldie Najat. She's the, the key special guest editor alongside a few guest editors from Japan. So Dr. Ihoko Otake Matsura. She's a team leader of Cognitive Behavioral System Technology Team at Riken Center for Advanced Intelligence. And she's been in this position since um, 2017. We also have Dr. Nori, Norihisa Miyake in robotics. So he is also part of Riken. So we do have these nice collaborations. And that's something that I would recommend if you're going for special issues to try and bring um, this kind of international perspective. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm just going to pass on to Noana. Um, yeah, if there are any questions, I think we have a couple of minutes and I see something in the chat that's popping up. Yeah, we've got a question here from, um, well, somebody wants your, um, uh, your, your email address. So uh, we can put that in the chat if you don't mind uh, there, uh, May. Uh, but one no question is from, from Jonathan Lowe. Does one need to have a strong background in either rehab or engineering to be a reviewer? No, I think that, that would be really helpful. But um, we're also looking for occupational therapists, for example, a background in that. Um, public health with a focus on technology or gerontology is, an, is another asset. So it is quite broad, um, but we do try and match reviewers with the topic area or the methodology of, of the paper. But if I have a key list, if you email me your information and your kind of like your background and your interests and expertise, I'll be sure to keep that list and, and email 
um, and, and invite you when there's a relevant paper that's been submitted. Thanks very much. Please feel free to email me again if there's any questions. I pop my email into the chat. And thank you. So I'll now pass on to Milana. Awesome. Thank you so much, May. So next slide. So my name is Nolana Neubauer, um, and to give you guys a little bit of background, so I am a occupational therapist, as Andrew had mentioned, at Lacombe Hospital and Care Center. So it's a little tiny town of 15,000 people, just an hour and a half south of Edmonton. And I'm also a working part-time as a postdoctoral researcher um, as part of the Aging and Innovation Research Program at the University of Waterloo. So I've been working virtually in Ontario, um, coming in from Alberta, and is led by the amazing Dr. Lily Liu, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Of. And so in terms of the expectations, I'm a little bit more junior than what the other two panelists are. Um, but for many of us that are within the health and aging space, we all know how incredible, how extremely competitive it is um, in this sector. Um, over the course of my PhD um, in 2015 to 2019 at U of A, I knew how important it was. Um, I have more than 20 publications, where more than 10 of them, um, I'm the first author. And I've had the chance to be able to publish a, um, a book chapter. And then I also had the honor to be able to more recently publish as part of a book. And even as part of my postdoc, I know that we think during when we're done our PhD that the urge of you should be writing goes away. But I can guarantee you during my postdoc that word doesn't go away. Even when I'm in clinical practice, I feel like I should be writing something. So it does not leave you. Uh, next slide. So I had the fortunate chance to be a part of um, the, one of the most recent books um, that was published through Ageville's Age Tech book series, um, and it is titled Autonomy and Independence, Aging in an Era of Technology. Um, so I am one of five authors that were a part of this book. And just to be able to share with you um, the good and the not so good when I went through this experience, because it's still very fresh in my mind, um, the good for me, really, it just came down to the incredible team that I was a part of. So I have worked with the co-authors um, since I started my PhD, so we're very close-knit. And from the words of Dr. Antonio Mingo Cruz, um, we truly are the dream team, is what he calls us, just in terms of how well we work and collaborate together. And it was more than just the co-authors that were a part of this journey. Um, it was literally Lily Lou's entire research program. We brought in undergrad students, we brought in master's students, PhD students, and even Lily's other postdoc. It was truly a team collaborative experience. And I really feel that it made this book as successful as it was just because of the team that I was associated with. For me, the not so good really was just because the book was in addition to the million other editions I had going on in my life at the time. Um, so I am a new grad um, for, from the OT program. So I was full-time OT school, taking six to seven classes a semester. I was juggling uh, fieldwork practice. And then I was also working as a postdoc. And then I was also running a consortium. I had just started a new group called OTEC, and I was a part of many other experiences, such as reviewing for journal articles, such as May had mentioned. So the little tiny bit of self-care time I had, I feel that it was taken away um, during this book, but I knew how, it, how important it was, and it truly was a good experience. Uh, next slide. So some of the key lessons learned, just to be able to share some words of wisdom, um, just from what I've gone through. Um, so there's five key lessons that I had found during this experience. The first one is you need to allocate a lot of time for revisions and editing. And I'm not kidding by a lot of time. So if you've been a part of the experience of publishing a manuscript, take that and I'd say multiply it by tenfold at least. Um, you're now dealing with a book that is more than 200 pages. You're dealing with a ton of references and there's a million different re revisions that you go through. So we had to go through writing the first version of the book, sending it off to Andrew so he could provide us with feedback. Go, up, go back and provide those revisions and then send it off to three reviewers from dis different disciplines, go through the revision again, send it back off to Andrew to see what he thinks. And then after that, once it went to the publishers, again, we probably went through about three or four more rounds of revisions. It was a lot, um, so just keep that in mind. The other key lesson learned is you just really need to set clear guidelines for each chapter to ensure consistency, just because it is, you're, we, we had 14 chapters that were involved, we had five co-authors, I was a part of the autonomy section, and really when you're aware of how many revisions might be coming your way, it's really good to have that consistency at the beginning, or else it means you're gonna have even more revisions at the end, so it saves you a little bit of time. Um, as well, you need to really be able to break down each chapter into smaller parts with concrete deadlines, 
And the big reason for that is because I was so used to writing manuscripts and this was a lot more daunting, just realizing how much I had to write. And just by having some of those different small parts, whether it was a quarter of a chapter I had to work on, it just really allowed me to just focus on those deadlines and then pick on them bit by bit. And then before I knew it, we had met the deadline and, the, and our sections of the book were completed. So that was the best way just for me to not get super overwhelmed. And I know that worked well for some of the other co-authors. As well, you just need to get something on paper and edit later. I know a lot of us, we're all perfectionists. We like things to be amazing first try. But again, when you're dealing with tight timelines, you're dealing with lots of different chapters you're responsible for, what I had found is just having something, even if I felt that it was bad, um, at least when we're having different team meetings, it was something that I can discuss with the other co-authors and it could help me really further conceptualize some of those different pieces I might've been stuck on. And then the final piece is differences in tone and style compared to traditional manuscripts. I had gotten really good at having a template in my head when it came to publishing for other researchers. It's, it's, you almost just have that once you do it enough times. But for the purpose of this book, you're now dealing with more than just researchers as the readers. You're now dealing with older adults. You're now dealing with care partners that might want to read it, clinicians. You might have engineers. So you really, we had to try to apply to multiple different end users. And we had to make sure that there was a tidbit, there was the different pieces that were understandable to all different types of audience that would get access to the book. Next slide. And so some other tips from what I had found from this experience. So what I found was that this book is a really good place for original research outputs that did not meet the criteria of academic journals. And what I mean by this is that there are might be some really cool findings or you might be in a very innovative area where it's not quite established yet. So a perfect example for me was that there is a concept called self-sovereign identity. So I did do a MITAC during the first part of one of my postdocs when I just finished with the PhD program. And I did it through Secours IO as the company that I'd worked with. And because self-sovereign identity was such a new concept, and it still is, I found that it was very difficult to find a journal that was willing to accept that information. So there was, I had no home for it, even though there was a lot of really cool tidbits that could be shared. And so the book was amazing because then I was allowed to, I was able to share some of those outputs that came from that project. And now that the field is starting to establish a little bit more, I'm actually able to refer to that section of the book when I'm working on this next publication. Another key piece that I can't emphasize enough is just the importance of weekly meetings with team members. Um, so our team, we had planned a meeting every single Friday at a certain time, and we did that for, uh, for about a year. And it might have seemed a little daunting at times that you're meeting all the time, even though you might not have, might not have progressed that much over the last week. But what I found was it really helped to see the bigger picture when it came to what the other co-authors were working on and just how things were going and how I needed to match even some of the different writing styles. And then as well, it just really helped me stay motivated and accountable because writing, as many of us know, it can be a very lonely experience. And when I was working on this book, this was right in the middle of the pandemic. I had online OT school, not even in person, doing an online postdoc and all my other responsibilities being online. So I swear I stayed in the same four corners of my walls for about the span of a year. But I, by at least having these team meetings, it really was the opportunity again to be able to share with each other and even have a chance to vent. If we were stuck on certain things or things just weren't going well, it was almost like that mentorship and the form of therapy just by having some of those weekly meetings. Next slide. So just in closing for me, just because I, again, I am more junior, um, is so for me, it's I'm currently getting clinical practice just because I am a new OT grad. But my end goal, like many of us, is I would love to one day get a job um, like me um, where I am working in academia or even if there's other opportunities in indus industry, I'm looking for that. Um, and so this is actually a picture of a hike that I did last month just outside of Canmore. And while I've done lots of school, 12 and a half years of university, I feel like I finally made it to that summit. And I'm really hoping that that book will be that little extra piece that will help me get over to the end of the, the other side of that mountain and be able to achieve my end goal. So that is it for me. I will open it up for questions. Thanks, Novana. Um, I'm not seeing any questions here yet, but I'll just give it one or two minutes. Uh, I really encourage anybody who's um, on the webinar right now to have a look at uh, the book that Nolana was involved uh, in writing with Lily Lou and the, the team. Uh, it's a foundational book for Agewell. Anybody who's in the age tech 
sector who's interested in technology and aging, you really need to be reading this book because it provides you with some key concepts about what we mean by autonomy and independence and how autonomy and independence is, uh, is, is expressed in the real world and the challenges that people have uh, as they grow older in terms of maintaining autonomy and independence and what the opportunities are for technology. Mm -hmm. So that's my sales pitch. <laughs> yeah, and even, and even to add to that, Andrew, so um, out of the authors, there is all of us but one, we're all OTs and another one was an engineer. And yeah, it's, it, it, it's really important because we, while we propose a lot of key concepts, we also were asking more questions. We had a lot, like most researchers, there's a lot of growth that needs to be done, especially within the autonomy space. Agewell has done amazing at focusing on independence, but there's huge gaps on autonomy. So feel free to take a look at that because it's definitely might give you some ideas in terms of even where we want to bring the, bring the industry in this area. Okay, uh, so thanks, Nolana. Uh, we're going to have more chances for um, uh, questions and answers at the end of the session, but why don't we uh, go on now to uh, Charlene Chu, who is an uh, assistant professor at the University of Toronto, and she's going to uh, give her perspective on things. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, next slide, please. Hi, everyone. Um, so it's a pleasure to be part of this awesome uh, panel um, and I'm just going to share sort of my high level insights and observations of my publishing journey. Um, so like Andrew said, I am an assistant professor at the University of Toronto at the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing. I'm also cross appointed to the Institute of Aging here at U of T and an affiliate scientist at Kite Toronto Rehab University Health Network. Um, so like Nolana, I'm a clinician. I've been a registered nurse for about 16 years or so. Um, and so when I finished nursing school, I worked uh, you know, as a staff nurse at the bedside full time um, for several years before I decided to go into my MN. Um, That's maybe about five or six years. And then I decided to go into graduate school. So throughout graduate school, very similarly to uh, Nolana, I worked full time. I you know, was completing my master's. I started my PhD, was still working full time. Um, and then eventually, uh, you know, tightered down my clinical practice as I went into data collection. Um, my journey with uh, AgeWell started I guess mostly around my postdoc. Um, my postdoc supervisor was um, Dr. Alex Mahalides, and so I, you know, was engaged with uh, AgeWell at that time. And so my interests are about improving the care of older adults, you know, technology-enabled interventions. My PhD was focused in uh, person-centered care and in long-term care, and so my program of research is really looking at post-acute care settings and how we can improve the quality of life of older adults and their caregivers. And so that, of course, includes nurses um, as well as family caregivers too. Um, so I think maybe to complement May and Nolana's um, talks, I'm gonna speak a little bit more broadly and more generally about getting published um, and sort of less with a, a destination, um, a publication destination in mind, let's say. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, click back one. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to play sort of around with these two concepts, pushing ahead and getting published in my uh, couple slides here. Click ahead, please. Thank you. Um, and so whether you're in your master's, your PhD, or your postdoc, um, or if you are an early career researcher like me or um, you know, like May, then you are sort of experiencing these ebb and flows in your momentum, in your time, in your energy. And really getting published is a matter of you know, pushing ahead through these obstacles. And so my own personal experience is that there's always going to be competing factors and interests. And so, you know, those things just change over the course of your trajectory. So in your PhD, you could be, or in your master's, you know, you could be um, having competing interests with life obligations, wedding planning, family planning. If you already have a family, um, balancing those obligations. Um, I know a lot of my students who are, you know, an undergrad and they are, um, interested in going into graduate school, that's always one of their concerns about whether or not they can balance um, all of the competing factors and life obligations that 
um, they are foreseeing in their future. Um, and then, you know, if you have a new job at, in academia, then you're going to be asked to sit on a lot of different committees to be a part of a lot of different groups. And so that also um, takes up a lot of your time. Um, you're going to be asked to teach. You might be asked to revamp different courses or even create a brand new curricula like I was asked um, to be a part of. And then also your uh, colleagues that you may have started the idea with, they're also going to have these competing factors as well. So it's a matter of, you know, even working within your team, negotiating through those things. Um, and I think with AgeWell, one of the one of the core tenets of AgeWell being interdisciplinary work and interdisciplinary research, um, you know, one of my closest collaborators is in engineering. And so even between health and engineering, there are different expectations of even where you are supposed to publish. So, um, you know, having some of those conversations um, can be obstacles, not necessarily obstacles, but opportunities to um, sort of, uh, you know, come to a compromise and, and um, negotiate with your colleagues. Then certainly there are practicalities involved. So like just finding the time to be able to sit down and write. Um, you know, if you have a full-time job, if you're in clinical practice, um, you know, like I was, for example, Next, there's also skill acquisition. So in order to write some of your papers, you might need additional training, learning new models, um, obtaining new software, learning how to work with that software or learning a new theory, for example, and applying that in your own work. So that takes time, that takes resources. Um, and so factoring some of those things in before you can even start some of the key work as well um, can be an obstacle. And then, um, I'll include in that also accessing the right people. So finding the right mentors who can help support you in gaining those skills and um, providing you with some of those opportunities can be an obstacle. Um, and then uh, lastly, sort of peer review. Um, Nolana sort of talked about this, the you know many cycles of peer review, but sometimes peer review can take six months, can take eight months. So, you know, these multiple um, sort of unexpected emails that you might get from, the journal saying, can you make these revisions and you have a very short timeline, but yet your plate is already full of other things and you really need to fit that in. And so, um, you know, the work isn't done when you submit a paper, it just keeps on, it can come back to you several times for you to revise. And so um, that is just something to keep in mind. Um, so obviously, so, you know, it's not easy, there are obstacles. And so without a doubt, um, there are also resources out there because so many um, students and uh, early career researchers need support in being able to overcome some of these obstacles. I'm not going to get into many of those, but the one I will mention is the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity. If you're uh, an early career researcher and your university will pay for you to um, access their boot camp. Their faculty boot camp is wonderful. I found it to be a really helpful experience. Um, and sort of the last point here is about payoffs. So I sometimes feel like we get lost or we're stuck in the weeds. We're really hyper-focused on getting a paper out and just sort of getting it off the plate. But really every paper is your opportunity to share your ideas, to share your learning, um, and to sort of contribute to a broader discussion. So um, it really is such an opportunity to be able to share your ideas. And so we sort of push forward um, to obtain that. Next slide, please. Um, so after you've pushed ahead and you're getting published, these are just sort of um, some of the most immediate thoughts that come to my mind when um, it comes to publishing. And so obviously this is not a fulsome list. There's you know many of these kind of uh, tip sheets and things like that out on the internet. Um, but for me, this is sort of what I always, my key things that I always go to. So first I would say, look down at your desk or go into your computer and, um, and look into your project folder. So chances are you've probably spent a lot of time writing out a very detailed protocol. And so there are um, different outlets now that will publish um, protocols. There are conferences that will also accept protocol papers as well. So, you know, look into exploring whether or not you can get the protocol of your actual study published somewhere. Um, the next thing is feasibility or pilot studies um, or usability studies. Um, a lot of people will just situate that within a broader study and then um, 
neglect to focus on some of the learning that's been involved in the feasibility study or in the pilot study. Um, and so I always you know, think about whether or not this can be published because that also um, provides a lot of rich, meaningful data. Also, depending on the kind of data that you do collect, if you've done a lot of uh, focus groups or if you've done a lot of interviews and your paper, your main results paper is a mixed methods paper, it's likely that you weren't able to really allow that richness of that qualitative data to come to light. And so um, potentially there could be a paper that you could cleave off there or glean off um, depending on the kind of data that you do collect. The next uh, kind of tip I have is to think laterally. So I always say this to my students as well, like when you are working with patients or when you are at, um, you know, in your lab or when you're talking to end users, keep an open mind and jot down notes. Think about what people are saying to you, write down what people are saying, think creatively, um, keeping your eyes open. And so even though you have a specific research question, when you are doing your data collection, you know, keep an open mind as to what other avenues you could um, explore next. Um, also, thinking laterally, uh, you want to think about what are some other audiences that might be interested in what you have to say? Um, you know, are there other clinical groups or or could it be um, tailored more to uh, a social sciences perspective? Or could it be tailored to a more general, um, you know, maybe a management perspective or an or a administrative perspective? So again, thinking about um, other target audiences. Um, and then again, thinking laterally, who else is sort of in this space? Who can you collaborate with? Are there international uh, groups that you can be part of? Are there uh, researchers from other countries or uh, researchers that are sort of in um, a similar area with similar interests that you can um, start working with? And then you, you can build something together and that can really help your, uh, your research output as well because now, um, you know, you can both write and co-author each other's papers. Um, and then once you are done doing all of those things, you need to actually make a plan. And so I always like to say that publication is a team sport. You want to surround yourself with people that you can really bounce ideas off of. So this is really important in your early um, careers thinking and, you know, especially if you're a postdoc, um, having some confidants that you can talk to. Um, and then also having a mentor. So someone who's a bit more senior who can provide you advice um, from their perspective and, you know, having a really good team that you can, that you can work with, that you can gain support from. Making a timeline is really important, but also realistic being uh, um, flexible as well. And then having a routine. I think I think you see this all the time and this is so much harder <laughs> to do um, than, than it is to be said, but having some type of routine where you commit to writing every day, even if it's terrible, but just that practice of sitting and writing because there is the adage that writing is thinking. And so it really helps you think through some of those thoughts and what it is that you wanna move to. Okay, next slide, please. So once you get published, um, you know, I think it's really important to realize that it's your work, the, your published work that pushes you ahead and it also pushes science ahead. And I think this, sometimes we don't think about this as a bigger picture, that your work is contributing not only to your own personal trajectory, which I think is what we tend to focus on. I just want to get this, you know, paper out so I can graduate. I want to get this paper out so that you know, I have another line on my CV or I can, um, you know, win a grant or an award, but it's also for a greater purpose, which is the science of what it is you want to contribute to. So as you start publishing, I think it's fairly intuitive to continue to publish because you keep on having more ideas, you keep on thinking more creatively in this way, and the work really doesn't stop. And um, especially if you're in academia, your, your expectations to publish are really high. And so at this sort of juncture, I think it's really important to reflect uh, about what pushes you ahead and what is really important to you about your work. Why are you doing this work? What are the values of your work? What is the goal of your research? And, um, you know, thinking about sort of these questions about what defines you as a researcher. So I think it's really worthwhile to ask some of these questions about your work, um, as well as yourself as a researcher. And so in what ways does your work push the field ahead. So can you build on, um, you know, existing literature, existing research, um, you know, not necessarily finding a gap or disparaging any, any um, 
um, work that has not been done yet, but rather acknowledging and saying that you are going to build on that. Um, and then can, in what ways are you able to contribute to the conversation, um, sharing your narrative, sharing your, your perspective, um, wherever that may be. And then can you outline potentially future directions about um, things that are valuable to explore in the future? And so really, you know, your work will lead to more work. Um, and I think that you're going to constantly be um, pulled potentially in different directions, but it's really important. And I think one of my key messages here, as you are pushing ahead, in order to get published, to keep on getting published, is to really stick to that roadmap about what your values and what your goals are of you as a researcher and you as um, what your research will stand for. And so um, I think if you follow that roadmap, you're always going to be able to get to where it is you need to go. So maybe I'll end off there and I wish you luck on your publication endeavors. And I guess I'm opening, am I opening up to Q and A here? Yeah, so thank okay. you. Th really, thank you, Charlene, for your insights there. I think they were, they were really valuable. So yeah, we have about uh, five, uh, eight minutes for Q&As if anybody wants to um, uh, ask any questions online. Um, or do any of the panelists want to share any other thoughts? What One thing that came to my mind was that um, we know certainly within AgeWell, we have quite competing um, things that we need to do. So on the one hand, AgeWell wants to promote really great research, but we also want to promote real world impact. So for example, um, getting products commercialized, et cetera, et cetera, which is a big challenge or focusing on knowledge mobilization. How does one balance those things? Because, you know, commercializing a product isn't going to um, really give you that much value when it added value when it comes to say publications put it that way so do, does anybody on the panel have any comments on that i can speak to that a little um in as it's through some of my work in agewell um, as an hqp i've been able to participate in different um startups and different ideas and uh, you know we we have a two patents in place um, about some of our um, computer vision algorithms. And the idea is, I think we've played with the idea of commercialization uh, quite often. And I know that is um, a goal for many HQP as, as part of AgeWell, but it is challenging because conflict of interest is always there. Um, so if you are the founder of a company and you are trying to publish about that company to show that your product works. Um, there is a conflict of interest there that I think is, is um, obvious and like difficult to avoid. And so coming up with different shapes and structures around how to navigate that space, I think is really, is challenging. Um, and, and I think raises a lot of questions because I think, again, this is one of those competing interests where you want to commercialize, you want to you know, get into the startup industry, but at the same time, you want to do research and somehow those two things, um, you know, you want to sort of try to keep them separate so that you don't have any perceived conflicts of interest or any real conflicts of interest. But I, I'm not sure what uh, others on the panel might have to say about that. I just say it's, it's because there's so many different things that we're expected to do. I know, um, Andrew, you bring up knowledge mobilization. I think that is still incredibly important because you have many care partners, whoever your end user that was a part of your research study, it's really important to give back to those that were helping you along the way. But I'd say if you have an amazing team though, like as I've really learned, um, especially since Lily moved to Waterloo, just the power of the undergraduate students. There's so many that are keen and eager to learn. And just by being able to give them some of those key tools to be able to learn how to do some of the knowledge mobilization, they can do a lot of the key pieces and then you're just mentoring them along the way. And then you're able to meet that output and it can be the same for other different things. So that the power of the students, those of you that are students right now on the call, like there's it's the only way to survive. Don't feel like you need to take everything in your own hands or else you will not survive and you won't be able to meet everything. Yeah, absolutely. And just to add to that, I mean, just thinking about, you know, how Andrew and I have been doing a lot of community engaged research, um, something to link on 
to acknowledge mobilization as it relates to publishing is publishing with your non-academic stakeholders and that's something that's quite key and I haven't really highlighted yet. Um, for example, I'm working on publishing a paper with a couple of my older adult participants um, who are advisors on, on the project and they provided incredible input you know, into the publication in terms of writing, editing, new ideas. So there is the assumption that, you know, because you're not from academia, maybe you can't contribute effectively, but that's actually not, not quite true. So just wanted to add that point as well um, as it relates to publishing and knowledge mobilization. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree more on that, May. And it's it's even if like it's the end users that you're working with, like as I've published with the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario, I'm currently working on a manuscript with a startup company that I did my MyTax with. You can teach them. They all have little pieces to be a part of. And I think it's being more and more common, even Jim Mann, like it's, we all, all of us know who he is and he's publishing and he has dementia, right? So it's, you can really bring them on board with all these publications. And it's, I think it's more powerful. Yeah, just on, on this, um... I had a conversation uh, about with the editor of the Rate Journal, and there is an idea that there's going to be a special call for papers that are co-authored with community participants. Um, um, I've done that myself, and it's 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 great to have that uh, that perspective uh, in your in your your articles. And I think it's one of the directions which I think um, research publication is going to go more and more into going forward uh we've got maybe time do we have any any questions in chat i don't think we have we've got a couple of minutes well okay if we don't have any more questions why don't we um now uh i'm going to hand it over to uh agewell scientific uh, associate scientific director jennifer campos who's going to make some closing remarks for this year's uh, epic conference. So over to uh, Jenny. Before she Jenny, <laughs> uh, Je before Jenny uh, comes here, uh, just to thank the presenters today. So Charlene Chu, Meilan Fang and Nolana uh, Neubauer. Uh, fantastic, um, fantastic contributions and very inspiring, uh, I'm sure, to everybody who's been on the uh, call today. Well, it's Friday. We've made it. And what an incredible two weeks it has been. Um, so I, as Andrew mentioned, I'm Dr. Jennifer Campos and I'm the HWL Associate Scientific Director. Abby's here in the background, if you can hear me barking away, hopefully not too disruptive. Um, I think that we can all agree that it has been a truly epic 10 days. Um, this is a perfect opportunity to uh, join me in thanking all of the 55 presenters, uh, trainees, research, research staffs, PIs, mentors, stakeholders, uh, for taking the time to share their exciting work with us, and of course, um, all the fantastic insights. Um, this was the third year of the EPIC conference, and it would not have made, been made possible with, uh, without the age well education and training team, and particularly Allison Schneider, um, and all of our valued partners who hosted workshops, virtual lab tours, and fascinating panels on topics from ethics uh, to publishing in, in age tech. So a serious uh, round of applause uh, for everybody who was able to make this happen. It's been really, truly incredible. Um, over the past 10 days, we have been joined by over 778 people from 19 countries and counting. So Allison sent me those numbers, I want to say, about two hours ago. Um, and so I suspect those numbers are even higher now, but that is um, an incredible accomplishment and impact. Um, the continued support for the AgeWell conference, which is the largest trainee conference in age tech, and the keen interest in AgeWell's work highlights just how vital it is that our work continue. And I could really sense uh, that collective enthusiasm um, over the past couple of weeks. 
Um, AgeWell is Canada's technology and aging network and the only national network uh, that brings together researchers, older adults, caregivers, government, community groups, and industry to create and implement technology-based solutions, including services and policies that support the health and well-being of older adults and caregivers. And incredibly, our training program also supports over 1,200 graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and research staff across Canada. And these individuals receive both financial support and access to value-added programming on everything from ethics to entrepreneurship, stakeholder engagement, uh, to the policy research dynamic. And most important, of course, um, are, uh, is, is age will support uh, for trainees, um, but really kudos uh, goes to the trainees who um, have showcased in really uh, phenomenal ways uh, how they can um, pursue and advance uh, impactful science um, and implementable work uh, to make this uh, real, to have these real world effects um, on, on so many people and so many questions and problems in the age tech space. Um, based on all of the amazing and inspiring epic presentations over the past two weeks, I am extremely confident in saying that the future of age tech is certainly a bright one. And just a reminder, um, don't forget that you can also watch replays of any of the sessions that you may have missed, or uh, if you're like me, maybe sessions that you'd like to watch again, uh, because, uh, because you got so much out of them and we're paying so close attention, but you know, you always miss things here and there. Those links are on the Epic Conference webpage. And so with that, um, I would like to say thank you so much again to everybody. The um, EPIC Conference 2022 edition is formally adjourned, and I'd like to wish everybody a happy weekend. Thank you so much.